you can only play seven games before you know. Yeah, um, before you have a double yeah, before up. you before you have double ups. But um, I know that there's a bit of movement in Sydney for a team, um, and I think Gold Coast as well because they've just seen that. Um, because they've just seen how well their rival, their local rivals have done. Um, and then and then there's um, there's definitely a market there for it. So I think those those clubs would want to be pushing in, and I think we'll see an expansion in the coming seasons because it's really done well, hasn't it? I mean, it was only it, we only say seven weeks ago, but it feels not that long ago at all that we were talking about in our first show of the season. It was the first show of the season for us, yeah. and we were talking about it, and we were really excited for it. Um, my my f- predictions haven't gone too well. How about yours, Benno, as oh, we look to the grand final week next week? I think my predictions have absolutely failed. I mean, I think what, <laughs> I think a lot of us predicted Fremantle Bulldogs as the top two. I think so, yeah. And, uh, well, Freo and the Bulldogs are now playing for pride, really, this week, aren't yeah, they? They're, well, Fremantle do have a part in who could make the grand final. Um, yeah. Not because they have any shot, but more so that Melbourne are an off chance of making the grand final if results fall their way. They need for Melbourne to make it. They need to beat Freo and they need Adelaide to lose, and then Melbourne would be in. Otherwise, they need uh, if Adelaide wins and Melbourne loses, Adelaide are in. If both win, Adelaide will be in on percentage, and if both lose, Adelaide should be in. Yeah, but Carlton could be in. If, if Carlton get a mass, it's if really results go their way yeah. kind of thing, isn't it? It's very mathematical. I mean, the belief, technically, they could make it in, but... I think it's, it's going to take more than belief to uh, get them in, isn't it? But anyway, that um, leads us into our first game this week, which is Melbourne Freo. It's um, 4.35 tomorrow afternoon. And like you said before, Melbourne uh, need a win here. They're in with a shot in the grand final. Um, and it's a Casey Field, so it's a bit of a home ground advantage to Melbourne. What are we thinking is going to happen in this one, mate? Well, I think Melbourne need a win here. I mean, they need a win more than Freo really need a win. And I just think with the home ground advantage, it's on a Saturday, so it's not at a... I mean, it is still at a weird-ish time. Yeah. But they're getting more of that uh, prime time because there is no AFL on this week. Whereas in last week, we saw the times being moved around a lot because Yeah, of we were pretty JLT. critical of it, weren't we? Yeah, it was all like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning kind oh, of games. Yeah. Um, I think that's something that we'll definitely see go next season as well. Yeah. I definitely think next season they might even put the JLT games beforehand because people don't care. People not really. No, I mean unless you're unless you're uh, you're Dan and you're really into your super coach and you're just looking for a couple of pointers. <laughs> well, um, most people don't really mind too much what goes on, do they? <laughs> not really. I, mean, I think we saw even with the crowd numbers, barely any game got above four. Got above five figures. I think. Essendon Collingwood got 16, and that was the highest by a fair way. Yeah, and that was one of the first games of, well, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the first it, it game. It was the first game, yeah. And obviously that had some some pull with the Essendon players for the first time since their ban running out. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Collingwood being a massive club. So I think we will see that um, these women's games will be put on as the main feature, which I think is good. Hopefully they still keep the prices free. I mean, I think that... Yeah. The, I think it is easy for a trap to be set for the AFL to try and cash in already in terms of the popularity, but mm. you just need to keep it growing. I mean, I think so. I think it needs to get to the point where um, free tickets won't be the main lure for people to come to matches. Like at the moment, I mean, you know, it's good to see, and it's great, and it's good football, and we all enjoy it. But I think there's still maybe that lure of uh, free entry that's bringing people in. And if the AFL wait two or three seasons and we see more games and we've had higher scoring games as the season's gone on. And I think this uh, last week, Collingwood broke the record for the highest score in a match. And so we're seeing the standards improving, but I think we just need to wait a little bit until the competition's really, you know, comfortable. And then we can start charging and then you can sort of tie it in with um, the men's teams and that kind of membership kind of deals and that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, we're all really excited about this one. Um, I'm thinking probably Melbourne by two-ish goals here. Yeah. I've got Melbourne by about two to three goals. I just think Melbourne need to come out and they do need to trounce Freo. They need they need a win. That's a, that's bottom line here. They really need a win. And they need to, put, they need to just... Freo, Freo weren't too bad last week. They got their first win last week, so they were looking better. But like you said, if Melbourne don't win, it's game over for them. So. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will be getting behind Melbourne, I think, because people have been surprised by how well the interstate clubs have done. I mean, mm. Brisbane and Adelaide, people, many people thought that Brisbane, uh, sorry, that Adelaide wouldn't have the chemistry to, to yeah, play Yeah, and most people just thought well. that Brisbane just couldn't play. I mean, they had Taylor Harris, but apart from that, people hadn't really heard of many of the players. Yeah, so exactly. they were like, we don't know how this club's going to do, but 
We've seen how well they've gelled. We've seen that week after week, Frederick Traub, uh, Harris, Zilke Ver- in the midfield, Zilke, yeah. Virgo. I mean, they've yeah. just they've had p- performances all round. It's been a really even performance. Whereas you look at other clubs and you look at how the focus has been on Moana Hope, or even even at a club like Frio, the focus has been on Donnellan. Yeah. There's none of that at at Brisbane bar people just knowing about Taylor Harris because of how well she's played, not because she's been yeah. hyped and that into like, it. Almost like kneeing her head when she kicks the footy, oh. and I think that's about the only thing. Incredible. Really that's I think that's the thing most people knew about it. But um, so Brisbane this week, they I think um they're pretty much confirmed to play at the yeah. Gabba next week, yeah, which they, is pretty good. That's really good. I mean, that'll be good for just Brisbane football in general. I mean, I think so. It gives Brisbane, it gives Queensland footy fans something to celebrate. I say, yeah, I'd say. And they've been lacking that for a while. Oh, haven't we? <laughs> but um, so Brisbane play Carlton this week, um, and at Icon Park uh, on Sunday afternoon. So, and like we said before, it really, it really needs Carlton need to win this one by a lot, and then hope that everything else goes their way yeah. to get a spot in the grand final. What do we think about Brisbane here? Do we think Brisbane are looking to go that whole season undefeated, or are we going to see them playing a bit more? bit more guarded no mission, sort of not really doing too much thinking about next week. Well, I'm not sure because on the one hand, like you want to be able to say we went through the first AFLW season and we didn't lose a game. Mm. But that means nothing if you get your best player, if say Harris gets injured this game or Frederick Traub gets injured this game and then next week you put up a horrid performance and lose. Because yeah, you exactly. can still have that undefeated season. But it wasn't undefeated. It means nothing if you lose in the grand final, yeah. doesn't it? So I think I think they'll be going through their paces. I mean, you wouldn't want to accuse anyone of playing bruise free footy, but we could see a bit of that. Yeah, this I think more just, it'll just be more making sure that they're set up their tactics and that kind of thing. All right, they'll be thinking a lot in terms of how they're going to have to play next week and maybe trying out a couple of those sort of systems. Um, and that be, and in, with that in mind, I'm thinking I'm I'm expecting I would just say Carlton to get up in this one. Like the allure of maybe making a grand final is pretty high. Brisbane probably won't be trying to. I'm I'm expecting I, I think probably Carlton by two in this one again. Yeah, I've got Carlton by a goal. I just think Carlton need to win. Like if they don't win this, then then their season I mean is over. I mean even if they do win this, the season most likely is over. But they yeah. need a win here. And Brisbane aren't going to want to want to um, lose anyone to injury, lose anyone to suspension. I mean, they will be trying out tactics, so we could see a couple of things that we haven't seen from Brisbane. I mean, Brisbane have had a look at Adelaide already in round yeah. five, and they did get the win there, but it was a close one. So I think they'll be trying to shut down Adelaide. I mean, they'll be working out tactics to shut down Aaron Phillips because a lot of the drive is coming from Aaron yeah. Phillips in that midfield. So, yeah, I think we'll see Brisbane uh, we'll see Brisbane lose their first game this year. Carlton yeah. by a goal, but who knows? I think, I think the storyline's a bit more than Brisbane losing their first game in this one. I think it's, I think um, it's more about next week. Yeah, I, I mean, think. it's preparation for next week. And yeah, pretty much. Yeah. They haven't played on the Gabba yet this year, so it'll be interesting to see that. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm wondering to see how they adjust... Um, I mean, it's going to be a different crowd. It's going to be the. Bi- it's probably going to be their biggest crowd as well next week. So they're going to have to get used to that. Um, it'll be one of their biggest crowds actually when they play Carlton Icon Park. Um, this is their biggest ground that they played at, and they'll sort of just need to get used to playing maybe in front of a few more people, playing at a higher intensity. Um, but yeah, I'm expecting probably Brisbane to drop this one, um, and so that leaves us two more games for this week. So we have GWS and the Bulldogs. They're playing in Canberra on Saturday night, and this one's really. a this one's really a pride match, isn't it? This one is very much... Who, one. who cares? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, Doggies almost knocked off Brisbane last week. They... they, they it was a close look, one, yeah. It was a close one. and But the thing is, for me, the Doggies, they've been pretty disappointing. They looked really good week one. Um, they looked really impressive week one, but since then, they've really not done much. Um, especially with that loss of Katie Brennan, I think, has, has probably affected them more than what we thought. I think... more than what seems apparent. Well, I think it's been said a lot that they look a much different team with Katie Brennan. I mean, they came out mm. that first week and even that first half in the second game, and they looked good. As soon as she got injured, their forward line lost a lot of potency, but they also lost a lot of leadership on field. Yeah. And, I mean, they do have Black... Uh, they do have Kearney, but they need they needed their marquee. They need Brennan in that, in that forward line, commanding the ball, kicking goals. Yeah, and we've seen we've seen this year that the marquees. I mean, I would say pretty much all of them have lived up to 
what that was expected yeah, of them. I think, bar, yeah, I think bar a couple. and a hope. I mean, yeah. Um, but she's been a bit of a different story. I think she was had she had a lot of attention on her um, coming into coming into the season, and her teams already sussed her out and really knew what they were going to do to get to play against her. And she and her Collingwood ladies go up against Adelaide on Sunday afternoon at Olympic Park. So the second week in a row, um, Collingwood finally get to play home games. Um, and like we said, Adelaide they win they're in the grand final um, I'm not sure if they lose can they still make the grand final yep if if they, if they lose if they lose um, it's most likely that mo- both teams will make it if they yep. lose in, um, if both teams lose it will be Adelaide or Carlton mm-hmm. if um, if Adelaide lose and Melbourne win then Melbourne will be in yeah but otherwise it's pretty much Adelaide's. Adelaide wins, they, they make the grand final. So it's pretty simple. I mean, they only need to win by one point and they make the grand final. Exactly, so, yeah. But, but I don't know. I can just see Collingwood in front of a home crowd. They looked really good last week, finally playing at their proper home. Um, yeah, like we said, uh, like I said earlier, they scored the uh, highest um, score of the competition so far. Am I in a hope kick 2-4? So you can only imagine what would have happened if you reverse those figures. It would have been even more... Yeah, well, I mean, they were very inaccurate. They kicked, what, 13 behinds, didn't yeah, they? Seven, seven, third, seven, seven and 13, yeah. Um, so, that being said, though, I still think Adelaide, they need to win to make the grand final. I can't I can't go past them in this one. No, I think, I think unfortunately, Adelaide, they're too well set up defensively to let Collingwood get on top of them. I mean, Collingwood mm. very much... I think they need to kick a lot of goals to win a game. And a lot of that comes from hope. Yeah. And Adelaide, like you said, they're defensively, they're really well set up. They would know that they need to close her down. Um, the G- it's just mainly she she kind of scored last week because GWS's defense is... It, it is... Well, yeah, it is a little bit below par, if you ask yeah. me. I mean, there are... I mean, GWS have shown some signs, but I think there'll be some serious soul searching over the I think off so, season yeah. in terms of their recruitment strategies because it just hasn't worked for them. Mm. So, what do you think in this one, Benno? Adelaide? Um, I think Adelaide by three goals. I mean, I don't think it'll be as brutal a uh, drubbing as we may as we have seen in the past. I mean, obviously this game, Collingwood, uh, GWS, it was about forty points, but. Mm. I do think we'll see a high-scoring one. I do think Adelaide will get the jump on Collingwood, though. I just think they have too much firepower to uh, to um, be held down for too long. We could even see Collingwood hold them for a half, restrict them. But I just think in the end that they'll... They, they will, have the run, don't they? They have the run. They have some explosive pace. Yeah. They've got good tactics as well, so I just can't see them losing here. Yeah, for sure, mate. And we're going to go to um, our votes as well for last week. Um, and I've gone one vote, Daisy Pierce. Um, you know, Melbourne won again. We keep saying this every week, but she had 20 touches and a goal. And her, um, her packs been a myth and have really impressed me this year in um, Melbourne's midfield. So, yeah, one vote for Daisy Pierce. Two votes, Emma Kearney. Um, in a losing side, 30 touches in a losing side is a really impressive effort, isn't it? I mean, we did, we did look at the stats and it was about two-thirds handballs, but that's still... I mean, thirty just thirty in a AFLW game, full stop. That's, is just imp- that's a fair effort for an AFL game. Yeah, I mean, well, we say a when, a, a leg, when, a, when yeah, when when a bloke gets thirty touches, we all go well, had a good game. Um, and so to get thirty touches in half the time is really impressive. And so she's got two votes for me. And third, I've got O'Donnell from Fremantle. Um, you know, finally got their first win. Um, and she she was really impressive for me. She's one of their uh, marquee players, and she's. Uh, even despite how Fremantle have gone, she's been doing a she's been doing her job really well over in the West. She had twenty four touches, eight tackles, two goals. That's that's a stellar game as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean I've gone. I'll put this out there. I've gone three votes Donlan as well, <laughs> but we differ on our one and two. I've gone Paxman one vote, uh, twenty one disposals, fifteen kicks, five marks, five handballs. I mean, pretty complete game. Yeah, it's it's arguable who played better out of Pierce and Paxman, but you can't go wrong with either of them. They've they have been driving force along with as you mentioned, Mithin, who I think has been a little bit of a surprise packet yep. for Melbourne. But yeah, those three have really driven that midfield and formed the backbone of Melbourne's success this year. Two votes, Aaron Phillips, twenty disposals, seventeen kicks, which I was really impressed by. She just sets up so much play from the middle of the ground. She knows how to pop up forward. She's kicked a few goals this year. She's been really impressive. She also had three tackles and two marks. And then I've gone three votes Donlan. I mean, 
Donnellan would I reckon Donnellan will be top uh, top five in the best and fairest, if not top three. She's been she's honestly been a beacon in that Freo lineup. I mean, they've struggled really in terms of consistency getting I mean getting their first win last week against Carlton who I would say would have been the favorites in that game but I think she's really stood up and in years to come she will can once the team builds around her yeah Freer will be a force I mean the the signs are there from time to time yeah, they but just it just hasn't been this, consistent just enough. Clicked. Yeah, I think it just hasn't been consistent enough um, for most of their players this season. But anyway, that's a preview of the final round of the AFLW. Next week, we're going to be very excited to talk to you about a grand final. Yeah, oh, that's going to be... <laughs> I'm very excited think, for the grand final. <laughs> oh, I wonder why, Samuel. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, We're going to crack into a song now. This is Flume with Innocence featuring Aluna George. And you're listening to Sports Desk on Sin 90.7 FM. To Sports Desk on Sin 90.7 FM. That was Flume with uh, Innocence featuring Alu- Aluna George. And we've had a big day of cricket uh, yesterday. We saw the first day of the third test in India in Ranchi. And Australia got off to a bit of a shaky start. I mean, we saw Warner come out, just try and smash everything. Yeah. Renshaw, Renshaw played a solid innings before they both went out. But then something that we haven't seen in a long while from Australia, some actual fight. Yeah, a bit of a bit of oh no, it's happening again when we saw Shaw Marsh go out for two, then Hanscom, you know, get a good start and then give away his wicket again. And then our man, Glenn Maxwell. You heard it first on Sports Desk. Ben's praising in the studio because he's been saying it for as about as long as we've been as long as Australia have been in India. Glenn Maxwell should be batting at six. And he's and eighty two not out at the end of the day, faced his longest ever international innings of 147 balls. It's still going. He was just impressive. He was, he did, he batted to the conditions perfectly um, and he showed a lot of maturity for a bloke that honestly most of us remember for charging down the wicket first ball and leaving it and getting bowled. Or, or when he was in the, in the Big Bash that one year and he's just like... Yeah, that one just... No. Just, if you if you can't say that at at home because this is a an audio audio medium, um, he just when he left it on middle stump and just looked around like I don't know what's happened. <laughs> he was trying to find someone to blame, couldn't find anyone to blame. But yeah, so Australia finished it at four for two hundred and ninety nine. We were four for a um, four for one forty. Four for one forty. Yeah. yeah. So Smith and Maxwell put on a hundred and fifty seven. I think something like something like 159? that. One hundred and fifty nine. One hundred and fifty nine. Yeah, something around that. Either way, a great a great fourth uh, fifth wicket partnership. And this actually means that Steve Smith makes his second 100 of the series. He's 117 not out. He's the only bloke to make 100 this series, and he's made two of them. Um, how, how, much, how much does Australia rely on him? We rely on him so much. Um, he came out when wickets were falling around, or well, a couple of wickets were falling around him, and he's played sensible good cricket, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think we do, unfortunately, we do rely a lot on Smith. I mean, mm. when you have a player as good as him in the team, you're going to rely on him. But I, d- I just think... Smith is, I think he's silenced a lot of critics on this tour because a lot of people, I think, were were hoping and expecting him to fail. I mean, obviously not Australians, but I think there is a little bit of a perception even still that Smith can be a little bit of a flat track bully. Yeah, or just is very much just enjoys pace bowling, doesn't really play spin that well, but he's played exceptionally. He's used his feet exceptionally well this um, tour. And with that yesterday, Ari becomes the third fastest Australian to 5,000 test runs, which is an amazing yeah. effort for a guy that came in and started batting at number eight in the start of his t- um, career. I mean, he yeah, he, for a long time he played at eight, was bowling part-time legs, leg spin, and no one rated him. For him I to, didn't. I didn't rate him. I, I will put this out here. I thought he should have been dropped. Just didn't have any idea why he was anywhere near the test team. Yeah. And for him to... he, he The only two uh, Australian batsmen f- are faster than him were Matthew Hayden and Don Bradman. So you're in some fair company. Very, that, very good company, yeah. And I mean, I think that is probably the storyline to come out of the Australian test team at the moment. I mean, there are so many storylines going on. I mean, we saw uh, Renshaw, youngest bloke to make it a 500 yeah, test run. Um, but again, yeah, um, he, so he was the youngest 500 test run. So we've seen a lot of, um, you know, a couple of really good records being broken. Um, just quickly for India as well, um, Yadda was their main performer yesterday, um, two for 63. 
Um, it was getting a bit. It was getting the ball to reverse, and it was looking really dangerous in the wickets he took. It was looking really dangerous. But we're going back to Australia now, and one of the other storylines that we've been talking and covering um, for so many weeks now is Cummins is back in the team along with Maxwell, and they're two really good inclusions. Um, yeah, so the Cummins is back in the team um, after uh, Mitch Stark going home, and he's been. Uh, we haven't seen him play yet. He's had a. He's had what you want as a first day back in Test cricket after um, you know six years off. He hasn't had to do much. He just sort of sat there the whole day. He's going to come in at a number eight. If he makes a couple of runs, gets his confidence up, and, he, and he's given the new ball on a wicket that's doing a little bit, not too much, but he's doing a little bit. Um, that that's really good signs for him. Um, yeah, so the, the wickets, and talking about the wicket, it, it's probably the best prepared wicket we've seen uh, so far this tour. It was described a bit as like rolled mud, but um, it's not bouncing a hell of a lot, and it's not um, taking a lot of turn, but it is playing more consistently I, than I what we saw in Poon. I think it's playing more true than we've seen, and I think, mm. I mean, Australia did decide to bat first, and... Safe decision. I it's, think it, I think it's the, the right decision. I mean, it's probably the only pitch so far I'd say that I would have batted first on... Oh well, I just I just wouldn't want to bat on either of the pitches that we've seen. I would so have just far. gone home. Yeah, I would have just gone home. Yeah. I would have just dug up something in the backyard and used that instead. But I think what we will see is that it's it's pretty dry. It's pretty I think well it'll compacted. Break up. It's going to break up, and um and it might look nice now, but over the next four days, it's going to become a real. It's going to become a difficult pitch, like all the others we've seen so far in India. It's going to become a real difficult pitch to bat on. Um, and so we saw also something really odd yesterday was Coley's. Coley's injury. I'm not sure what shoulder it was. Something's but happened with his shoulder. Something, but it was deemed external. I'm not sure what um, classifies something as so being maybe external just something, injury. Maybe not affecting the muscle or anything. Yeah, I'm not sure. But either way, that means he can bat tomorrow, or well, later. Or it'll probably be later today in his normal spot of well, four. We, we hope tomorrow. We hope tomorrow, don't we? Because if we can make if we can make 500, 600 on this pitch, I think by uh, by the time that it gets to day four, day five, it'll be breaking up. Mm. And we've got three spin options. Surely we can close out. Yeah, and I think we need to capitalize. I think the more time we spend batting now, while the pitch is good, India are going to have to spend a bigger proportion of innings batting on a on a surface that's not going to be yeah, playing as well, and that's going to make it really hard for them chasing. Especially if we put on say five hundred of the first things. That's a huge. That's a mammoth target to have to chase down on a pitch that's, that may or may not be doing some black magic. Yeah, well later on we get there will be some. There was questionable some, spin. There, there will be some questionable spin and some questionable lack of bounce, like what we saw last week. In oh, a couple of absolute grubbers just mm. bounced. You can't do anything about it because they're bowling it that fast. It just rolls, hits you, hits you about the top of your ankle. Yeah, you're done so for. It had a couple of real, uh, really unlucky LBWs uh, last time around. But um, I just want to go back quickly to Matt Renshaw. He said he became the quickest bloke to 500 test runs. And he's really impressed me so far. I think his ability to bat at the crease and bat time has been super impressive. But one thing that I want, do want to say about him is, that, again, he gave away his wicket. I'd say he made 44, I think, yesterday. It was looking really comfortable. And actually was outscoring Warner uh, for most of the time, which is something odd. You don't often see Warner's partner outscoring him. But he gave away his wicket again. And that's the only thing about me that's probably frustrating me a little bit, is that he, he's batting so much time and he's making runs. And he's just giving it away before he can really put on a hundred or something like that. I wonder if it it might just be that he's so young that he's struggling. Mm. I mean, for some people, they can only concentrate for like as long as as, like, as so. As, there's a limited time you can concentrate yeah, for. And us. I mean, I think he'll learn that as he goes on. But yeah. I think he's shown enough that it's not a technical issue. No, I think it's definitely re- a concentration issue, and uh, especially when he's facing two hundred balls already. You can't blame him for losing a little bit of concentration. I mean, I, fi- I think we'll find that once he gets even more comfortable in the international scene, his scoring will pick up a little bit more because it might just be he feels pressure to score. I mean, mm. batting with Warner up the other end, even when Warner's not scoring, there's always the potential that Warner is just going to explode. And we say it sounds like such a good setup for your other opener. All you have to do is stand there and not really do much. But there's a lot of implied pressure, I think, to keep up to the scoring rate. All that, all that, um, that need to, all that thought, all that need that you must give one of the strike because he's going to make runs, and that's not always something easy to deal with if you're at the other end. Well, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, a lot of times people are just like, oh, anyone could do it. You just stand up the other end, face a few balls here and there, shut him out, let one of the scoring. But everyone wants to be the one scoring the runs. You don't want to be the exactly, bloke just yeah. standing there just. 
playing and not. And what happens if Warner's having an off day and doesn't yeah. really score that many runs? Then it's up to you. Well, um, that's exactly what we saw yesterday. Warner was yeah. just smacked a straight back at uh, Jadeja off a full toss. Mm. Then you've got then Renshaw and the rest of the team have to make up those runs. So I mean, don't get me wrong, Warner is an amazing bat, but it is a bit of a bit of a, a bit of a struggle batting with him because yeah. You've got to make the runs up if he gets out. Exactly, yeah. And we're going to talk, and also going to the um, Indian openers, uh, Murali Vijay's come back into the side and they've chosen him against a third spinner, which would have been uh, Jayant Yadav, who played the first test, wasn't really that impressive. So I think that's probably a solid selection move there uh, from India. So I think both teams are actually making good selection choices for once, we can say about both teams. And I was reading an article during the week um, that was comparing Virat Kohli to Ricky Ponting. Which I found quite interesting, and I think that's, and I think that's something that probably holds a bit more true than what we actually realised maybe at first sight. Because uh, both players started off in the one day team, and were and took a while to break into the test team, and they both they're both very similar types of aggressive um, aggressive captains, aggressive play anchors. They're both very good. Um, um, f- they both face uh, fast bowling really well and have some sort of minor deficiency at, around that fourth, fifth, sixth stump line outside off. Um, and it was quite interesting to see that I think that actually rings quite true, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, Coley, for for all the flack he gets in the Australian media, he is arguably the best batsman in the world. I mean, we saw, yeah. we saw Andrew Flintoff, I think, came out uh, recently and he said that he thinks that Collie is by far the best batsman in, like on the planet, mm. and he's. I think he said that Collie is in another world compared to all the other batsmen at the moment. Which, I mean, based off this series, it, it, he hasn't, yeah, he hasn't stood up to the pressure. But I think I think he's got a little bit distracted by everything else going on. I think he just loves to complain. Loves having he does love it. he loves the drama that comes with. It. He loves all the emotion and drama. He's a pretty emotional type of bloke. So I think he's probably just got caught up a little bit in that. And I'm interested to see how he goes whether he can provide a captain's knock in similarity to what Smith did yesterday and potentially today. I think I think there is a there's a massive hundred coming from him. I think so. I, I think, think it's only a matter of time. It's ideally it'd be in the fourth test and we win this one, who cares? <laughs> but yeah, I think I think, I we think, could I think it's massive, inevitable. Massive it, yeah. You can't keep a champion down like that for too long. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, Australia will resume today at four for two hundred and ninety nine. Um and in a pretty strong position, uh, we'll probably see India at some point today, tonight, yeah, I would so, going yeah. in for a bat. I want to see how the pitch holds up, whether it works for them, um, and also depending on how much Australia score. Because if Australia score 500, I'm very, I'd be leaning towards saying Australia are looking in a very comfortable position. If India sort of, you know, they they really let the game sort of flow without really much happening. They sort of just let it, let it happen in front of them. Um, they look, probably lacked Virat Kohli's leadership on the field. Um, Ajinka Rahane was captaining. He made a couple of questionable bowling choices. Um, I guess fair enough when they have to bowl so many overs in a day. They were bowling 90 overs yesterday. But um, I think he waited He waited until the 86th or 87th over to take the new ball, and it probably cost him about 30-odd runs. Maxwell, hit it. Maxwell started hitting. when um, Steve Smith actually spent an hour in the 90s yesterday, and in that period, Maxwell started hitting out. They could have taken the new ball. Back to the sports desk on Sin 90.7 FM, and that was Morat with sunglasses. And you're listening to Ben? Dan. And Sam. We have Dan who joined us. He joined uh, us from somewhere better. Yeah, I was just at uh, SEN. I got a little shout-out from Hamish McLaughlin, so there you that's go. Him, that, that's Dan just pumping up his own. The name uh, drops. The name drops. That's him. Lucy, yeah. Lucy, Lucy is in here, so someone's got to pick up the bang, slack. Bang, <laughs> Shoot Gary Lyon's hand. You know, there you go. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Yeah. There's all that stuff going on, mate. All right, we're going to go move on to the round ball now after you spent so much time talking about the uh, overball. I'm so excited. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so this week, Melbourne Victory lost their key marquee in Oli Bazanic. Um, he's been with the club since the start of last season. Made 63 appearances. He's our, he was our main marquee, our M- victories. <laughs> we're going to remain impartial here. You claim it. <laughs> victories, main We're joined marquee. by Kevin Musket in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, fellas? <laughs> um, Don't but, tackle me. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so um, he joined the club at the start of last season, and he's been, for a main marquee, he's been just, a, um, honestly, a bit of a letdown. Um, he came from the championship in England, and um, I was pretty excited when he first came to the club, but he hasn't really done much. Just disappointed, hasn't he? 
He has really, yeah. I mean, he's he's playing, he's playing, um, he's feeding to a really strong front front four, and I barely see him most of the match, to be honest with you. Um, he's gonna go to he's gonna go to the J League, um, and he's gonna break his contract early. Um, he did score the first goal in the 2015 FA Cup final, which victory won. But I think I think it's probably for the best for his career that you know he looks to goes to a better league in the J League, broader broader <laughs> horizons, yeah. <laughs> um, but this week's the second half of the um, round twenty three split week in the A League. Uh, City are playing Newcastle on Saturday night at Amy Park, and City are equal with equal third with Brisbane on points. Um, however, they're both twelve points behind Victory, who are in second, and they've got Perth a point behind them in fifth. City have been really good against Newcastle. They've only lost one home game in their last eight matches at home against them. Um, but they do lose Fernando Brandan to an ACL injury, and he'll miss the no remainder luck. of the they season. They have just no luck with injury, do they? No luck with injury, no luck with suspensions. Um, and that's probably what's cost them um, after they've won the um, FFA Cup final. Who's winning this one, Sam? Uh, City, 2-1, I'd say. City, 2-1. You've been a st- pretty, pretty good tipster of later. Well, because if you in when in doubt, go the draw. <laughs> yeah, and, good tactic. And I've gone and I've gone the draw a couple of times when I've been in doubt. Um, but also uh, one thing, just quickly, this is really important for City. They need to stay in third because um, they 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 own the City Fo- City Football Group. Have been talking a lot about how um, they want to play Asian football, Asian Champions League, and so the, how the qualification works for the A League is that the Premiers and the Champions both qualify for the A League. But if one, but um, if and the second place team in the league gets uh, uh, the playoff round, qualifies for the playoff round. So we get three teams that qualify. However, if the Premiers and the Champions come in the top two, the third place team in the league gets that third place, uh, gets that third spot in that playoff round. And that's going to be huge because at the moment, no one looks to be catching victory or Sydney. And so um, for City to stay in third gives them the best chance of playing uh, Asian football next year, which is something that their owners really want them to do. So definitely City need to be winning this one, I would say, to stay in hopes of doing that. But we're going to kick on to Australia's favourite anti-hero, Nick Kyrgios. <laughs> Nick Kyrgios. Legend. Absolute legend. I mean, he's beaten... Uh, we didn't say he was an absolute legend two weeks ago, <laughs> yeah, though, did we? we? <laughs> <laughs> and we also uh, gave a bit to Glenn Maxwell, and look how he's done. So oh, I don't, don't it's all so Beno, Beno has been frothing it for the last two weeks, and he's, when you weren't here, lads, seriously, he was loving it. He was. Oh, <laughs> I am reveling in it, but <laughs> we're going to stick to tennis sports, uh, tennis talk. Uh, Nick Kyrgios has beaten Djokovic uh, 6-4, 7-6, 7-3 in a tiebreaker to reach the quarterfinals of the Indian Wells Masters, where he will face Aussie Open winner Roger Federer on Saturday at a great time for all Australians at 4am 4 4 in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And so this is the second time in a week that he's uh, beaten Djokovic. He beat him at Acapulco I was gonna say in uh, Mexico, yeah. So, deja vu. And he joined, yeah, a pretty, I think... Illustrious waiting, club, yeah. A pretty illustrious mm. club to beat uh, Djokovic back-to-back. But to do it two times in a week, I mean, you would mm. think that Djokovic would have come out pretty fired up wanting to beat him. I think uh, Isterman may is apparently Kyrgios' new coach. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> teach him all this stuff. But, um, yeah, so the, the thing that's won Kyrgios both matches has been his really strong surf, and that's something that even Federer, the man that he will play, at that great time of 4 a.m. has been saying <laughs> is going to is going to be something that's hard to beat. Um, Kyrgios has hit with Federer in the past and said that, and he even admitted he had st- uh, trouble returning his serve. But are we seeing a new Nick Kyrgios here, lads? Do we think we've seen someone that's turned the corner? or It's too early to say, but I'm, I'm liking what I see at the moment. You can't. <laughs> you know, you can't say that he's doing poorly if he's beaten uh, the world number two. Yeah, he's number two. Yeah, world number two. Twice think... in a week. That's you know, that's something special. I, I would struggle to say that we're seeing a new Kyrgios because I think we've always known that this is within him. He just chooses when to harness it. I mean, he... I think, think he be- to, I think he beat yeah. Nadal at Wimbledon. He yeah, did. back was, in 2014. I remember staying up late for that. I think it was about yeah. 4 a.m. Yeah, we were, we were yeah. watching that. Yeah, we were watching that. We were, with um, Samuel on that occasion? We were. <laughs> there was nice. others around. <laughs> but yeah, um, he, he and he played amazing that day. Um, so we all, from that, that point on, that was his first major, like the first time he made it into the headlines, the first time that he was brought to national attention. Um, and he played really well that match. And we saw from that point on that he had the potential but it's all the other things, wasn't it? It was all the um, all the, 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 the tantrum, the disciplines kind of thing. That's really like, hasn't? It's really sidetracked what could be a very good tennis career. Well, I still think there will be a very good tennis career in there. I mean, we, it's we forget, but he's in his early twenties. He's got potentially fifteen years of tennis left ahead of him. 
he he could be anything. He a lot of people think he'll be top ten, top even higher based on his talent. And if he can harness that to the fullest extent, because he can do some things on the tennis court that uh, just uh, defy belief, <laughs> defy yeah. physics as well. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. He hits through the legs and stuff. I mean, he just am one shot in that rally. He just ambled up, hit it between his legs. Within two, two like two shots later, was just slicing it. Almost unplayable. I think one thing he definitely does, he has the confidence and that level of arrogance that you need to be a, a world number one. I mean, he's, he's moved up the rankings from 17th to 16th. So we'll see how he goes, and we'll probably be able to talk a bit more about him. Yeah, but, you'll hear more about that next week. But unfortunately, that's all we have time for on Sports Desk today. You can find us on Facebook at uh, facebook.com forward slash Sports Desk Sin or on Twitter, just search Sports Desk Sin. Uh, stay tuned for Schools on Air after after this and you can catch Sports Desk on, on the airwaves again on Monday from 9 to 10. Have a good weekend, guys. Ciao. Uh,